This episode is brought to you by the FemPower Health Chronic Pelvic Pain Channel. And if you're not subscribed and want to learn more about chronic pelvic pain, make sure to subscribe where you listen to podcasts. You can search for FemPower Health Chronic Pelvic Pain Channel or click the link in the show notes. And if you're interested in perimenopause and menopause, we also have a dedicated channel for that. Search for FemPower Health Perimenopause Menopause Channel to explore more. When you're in the thick of it, you can start to feel crazy. You can start to feel like, am I really being too sensitive about this? Is there really anything wrong? They say there's nothing wrong with me. So I want to validate people out there that are struggling with this because it's it's hard and it's complicated and you're not crazy. Welcome to Fem Power Help. This is Georgie. Today we dive deep into the often misunderstood connection between hypermobility and chronic pelvic pain. My guest, Allison Lowry, is a doctor of physical therapy. She has a decade of experience bringing a unique perspective as both a clinician and someone who has personally navigated these issues. And together we explore how hypermobility affects the pelvic floor, why it's crucial for the long-term health, and practical ways to manage and prevent pain. So if you've ever wondered how flexibility can impact your health in ways you didn't expect, this is a must listen for you. Allison, thank you so much for joining me today on the Fem Power Health podcast. I have been hearing so much about all these fascinating things that contribute to and impact chronic pelvic pain. And one of them I've heard is hypermobility. And so I did some research and I found a fascinating article that you wrote about this. And so I really appreciate that you're willing to make time to come on the Fem Power Health podcast and share your expertise in this area because chronic pelvic pain is complex and you know there's lots of ways to that it can manifest and the treatments that are needed and I just love to help uh, women put together the puzzle pieces and so thank you for helping us with the hypermobility aspects of it <laughs> me too i really like it it's one of my passions trying to get this information out there and I think so many women get dismissed with some of these symptoms and well, anybody who suffers from chronic pelvic pain, it's, it's complex, like you said, to figure out. And so I love being able to shed some clarity. Well, thank you. So why don't you tell us a a bit about yourself before we dive into this fascinating topic? So I've been a physical therapist for about 10 years now. And I myself have hypermobility and chronic pelvic pain. And it was things that I didn't know were really a problem until I got into the profession. I was a ballerina when I was growing up and I'd always been, quote, double jointed. And during my practice, a pelvic floor therapist came into our clinic and we got to talking. And the more I worked with her and the more we had conversations, the more I realized that the things that she was treating, I was missing in my practice. That was a whole section of patients that I was missing out on that I, you know, the patient that isn't getting better, that you can't quite figure out why. That was the missing component was they had a pelvic floor condition that I wasn't able to screen for. And so we both ended up learning a lot from each other and developed this really great symbiotic relationship where we collaborated all the time. And so now I've taken what I've learned and I've put it into our residency program that we have. And I guest lecture at some of the universities and things like that to really show where that overlap is with orthopedic conditions and pelvic floor conditions. Because in PT world, we want to keep them really separate. And in medical world, we want to keep them separate too. And we forget that their muscles that impact our hip and our spine and the way that we move and walk and our day-to-day function. Wow. So tell me a little bit about the nuance of the area that you specialize in versus some of the colleagues, because I, I will say on the Fem Power Health podcast, I've done tons of episodes on mm-hmm. chronic pelvic pain, and actually a lot of them just stem from pelvic floor 
PTs coming on the podcast and sharing different things that they're working with patients on, not even just from a specific condition, but just navigating the complexities of the pelvic floor. Um, And I'm noticing there's like all these subspecialties almost within that. Um, So maybe you could just tell us kind of the nuances of what you do versus your colleagues, and then we can dive into everything that we need to help educate women on. Absolutely. So I have a, I'm a board certified orthopedic specialist. So I treat everything from neck pain to knee pain, post-op, you know, chronic pain, all of the things. But pelvic floor is one of those, you know, niche kind of subjects where you have to take special courses and be certified in order to treat those specific conditions because of the internal exam component and then because pelvic floor is so complicated within itself. So I do not do any of the internal work. I am not a pelvic floor therapist, but working with my pelvic floor therapist, we echo a lot of the same things and I'm much better equipped now to recognize where the overlap is and how to treat pelvic floor from the rest of the functional perspective versus just the pelvic floor muscle dysfunction versus just the incontinence components or the bowel bladder dysfunction, the sexual dysfunction. Like my role comes into it is the overall neuromuscular re-education of everything, trying to figure out how to get back together to function appropriately after someone's had, you know, pelvic floor muscle dysfunction specifically. Okay. Got it. No, that makes sense. And I find the more subspecialized someone is, I'm noticing that they understand their, I guess, parallel, so to speak, specialist, subspecialist counterparts. So you all can refer to each other. So I'm seeing that here, that parallel almost with your pelvic floor PTs. And then probably there's sexual medicine specialists that get involved. So this is the chain. And I I like to start this because, you know, one, I I nerd out on this stuff, but two, I want women to kind of understand upfront, like this is complicated and you do have to find the right expert. And luckily the subspecialists seem to usually know the nuances that not always an OBGYN would know. Um, And again, it's not a knock on the profession. It's just the dynamics of how the healthcare system is playing out. A hundred percent. And that's one of our huge frustrations too. I mean, I remember when I was experiencing pelvic pain for the first time and my pelvic therapist friend reproduced my pain because the GYN couldn't figure out what was going on. She's like, I don't know. You don't have cysts. You don't have this. You don't have that. I don't know why this is happening. And after a couple of treatments, I was better. And I went back to the GYN singing praises of like, look, we figured this out. And she was like, neat. (laughs) That's the worst. I I just, I gave you the holy grail. (laughs) And it is, it's just the way that unfortunately our health system is structured. I will say I'm, I'm glad to be seeing it changing a little bit. We're seeing a lot more referrals coming from Eurogyne and coming from GYNs. And actually, our hospital system has implemented now um, a mandatory, like an automatic referral for any person who's postpartum. Nice. Finally. Mm-hmm. So they don't always come. But they always get the call, they always get the education on it, and then they're educated to come do their six-week postpartum follow-up to make sure everything is healing up as it's supposed to from a pelvic floor standpoint. All right. So let's dive in and talk about hypermobility. So a lot of us don't realize that this is not always the best thing in the world to have. Like It looks cool, Cirque du Soleil, but (laughs) from a health perspective, it causes a lot of problems. It, it does. And people are like, oh, well, you have so much flexibility. Like, it, that's great that you can still contort yourself into these positions. And <laughs> part of me is like, man, I am just waiting for that arthritis to kick in, though, so that I get a little more stability. Tell us about hypermobility and pelvic health. Like, how how does this tie together? So, Hypermobility as a definition, like especially when we start looking at, you know, somebody who's got a lot of hypermobility, this hypermobility spectrum disorder where you have multiple joints and it's a a true connective tissue disorder. It's not like you just happen to have some really flexible thumbs. It's it's a systemic connective tissue condition. Really? So when, mm -hmm, so which affects 
blood vessels, your digestion. So from a pelvic perspective, though, so when you have muscles and tendons and ligaments that have increased extensibility, they're more flexible because they've got different qualities to their connective tissue, those muscles have to work twice, three, four times as hard to do their job as somebody who's got normal levels of stiffness of their tendons, ligaments, and muscles. So the pelvic floor's job is to create stability within the pelvis. So it creates that foundation point for the spine to function from, for gait, stair climbing, all of the things that we do throughout the day. But then it also increases our intra-abdominal pressure, which also stiffens the spine and creates some of that spinal stability. So if you have increased tissue extensibility and you're more flexible, those muscles don't always have enough strength to do their job, and then they can go into dysfunction. They can become deconditioned and really weak and not be able to do their job, or they'll try to do their job so hard that then they end up in that kind of spastic, hyper-contracted state where they're, they're just constantly in dysfunction trying to hold everything together and create stability which then leads to more problems with the pelvic floor dysfunction. How would someone know if they have hypermobility? Let's start there. And then I want to understand, yeah. you know, if you do have it, what are the things when you're saying it has all this impact? We've talked about the the, the structure, mm-hmm. but like what will be the long-term impact if we do have it? Right. So let's talk about hypermobility first. So when a person's got hypermobility, these are the people that, you know, you were told you were double jointed when you were a kid. Maybe you could do the splits when you were younger or, you know, you sit in goofy positions with your knees, you know, folded up at the table all the time. Um, hypermobile people also tend to wiggle a lot. They have a hard time sitting still in class sometimes or even at home watching TV. You know, they're the people that are folded up on the couch in a little ball and then constantly changing positions because their tissues start to stretch out and it feels uncomfortable. So then they change and they move and to try to kind of reset, if you will, their system. So that's one thing that people will notice. The big thing is the the double jointed component is so people realizing how flexible they might be specifically in their knees, hips, shoulders, fingers. So there's um, the Biton scale is one tool that we use and it's it's a real simple look at do your elbows hyperextend. So when you straighten your elbow out, does it bend past? the straight line. Right. Same for knees, fingers. Do they pull past 90 degrees? Can you touch your thumb to your wrist? Um, You're and hyper being able to stand up <laughs> And on the floor is, is the other one. So if you have enough of those kind of, you have to have it in multiple places, right? The other thing that people might suspect hypermobility with is if they're, ha- if they have digestive issues, if they also have chronic pain, if they have TMJ issues, if they have migraines, those are all things that are associated with having that increased tissue extensibility throughout their entire body. Oh, But the cardinal sign is that flexibility throughout in multiple joints. Okay. Wow. (laughs) I, I like want to go with like how do we fix this? I want to go straight there, but but let's no. let's try to take this this apart. So, um, so we've talked about like what it is and some of these symptoms, but from what else could be happening? So this digestive thing, I almost want to dive into because um, mm-hmm. what I have found because my son had some issues that took us years to navigate with clinicians because I find that. One, if there isn't a very clear treatment or a diagnostic, 
it's hard to invest the research dollars. People just aren't as invested in it because there's not a lot of revenue to be generated. And so I could imagine hypermobility and digestive issues being falling into that category of why do research? Because what's going to be the treatment? Um, and I'm assuming a lot of your work is going to be the treatment. So can you help me understand why hypermobility and digestive issues are tied together? Yeah, and you're right. There's not a lot of research that specifically looks at that. We just know that it's associated, right? So, and it, it falls into that category of IBS, which is that catch all of we don't really know. You vary between constipation and diarrhea all the time. You, you know, maybe sometimes you're more sensitive to foods. A lot of people it manifests as GERD, like the reflux um, and heartburn. And it doesn't follow the typical patterns of it only happens with spicy foods or, you know, something like that. So it's the theory behind why it tends to happen that way is that there's some theories about like just over overall systemic like inflammation, like that people with hypermobility just might have like more sensitivity to some things and certain foods and it's different for everybody. Okay. But the other part of it is your digestive tract itself also is more flexible. And so it doesn't have the same strength of contractility and being able to push things through You've got pelvic floor dysfunction or you've got inflammation from something like that, that leads to more pelvic dysfunction as well. Interesting. And so what are some of the pelvic floor dysfunction things that can happen? Obviously, I know prolapse is one of them. What else should people be aware of? The pelvic floor stuff that's going to be associated more with the hypermobility is usually going to be more muscle dysfunction. Okay. It's going to be because your you don't have enough stability in your spine and your pelvis to to move and do the things that you need to do so your pelvic floor is going to contract or be too weak to do its job so that's going to manifest with incontinence issues or pelvic pain or pain with sex pain with tampon use things like that even um, bowel movements too then the other half of it is having irritable bowel, having this back and forth of constipation, diarrhea, and then the way your diet can influence the levels of inflammation that you have in your colon and in your gut. There's a really interesting phenomenon that happens within the pelvis, and it has to do with the way that our nervous system is wired and how our brain perceives where sensations are coming from. So inflammation in a pelvic organ actually impacts the muscles too. So if the colon is inflamed with IBS, the pelvic floor muscles themselves can also become inflamed and reactive and you'll get pelvic floor muscle dysfunction from that. And so then they start going back and forth and feeding into each other as well. Wow. I guess where does the pain aspect fit in? And, and I'm, I'm asking because I'm assuming people may not always experience the pain and maybe people experience it to different degrees. So if it's not, if it doesn't manifest in pain, then it it can manifest in continence issues for one, or even um, constipation. Because sometimes the constipation's not actually um, from the stool; it's from the pelvic floor muscles being in dysfunction, right, and and being too tight, not being able to have the correct sphincter control. And it doesn't have to be painful. A lot of people it is, but so that may be one way that it manifests. And then um, we had mentioned pelvic organ prolapse. That's also one way that it can present as well. And that's oftentimes not painful. And it does happen more often to people who have hypermobility as well. The other thing that can happen, because you don't have to have just straight pelvic pain with it either. It oftentimes manifests with hip pain, low back pain. And um, people will complain a lot of that sacroiliac joint region, that SI region, kind of like between where your cheek and your low back meet is the other place that people complain about pain. So I guess how, how do we rectify this and repair it? Let's, uh, let's focus on pregnancy because that's really where we see it manifest for sure. So 
with it because oftentimes we have more um, tissue flexibility in general when we're younger. And so you'll see even high level athletes like gymnasts, like Olympic gymnasts will have pelvic floor dysfunction and incontinence because they're so strong everywhere else, but their pelvic floor hasn't been able to do their job. And that's not, you know, a typical person that you would suspect having an issue, right? So that's one life stage. But then when we start getting into pregnancy, when you're pregnant, you, your body releases relaxin and other hormones that make you more flexible because your pelvic bones need to be able to separate, right? To accommodate a baby that's growing in there and then to accommodate delivery. And so This can manifest with um, increased sciatic type pain, increased pelvic pain in general, increased low back pain, and it usually happens sooner in the pregnancy for hypermobile people than it does for those that are not hypermobile. Got it. But, you know, those kind of symptoms are common. It's common for anybody who ends up pregnant, but significantly more for someone who's already hypermobile. Okay. And then all of those relaxing hormones stick around postpartum while you're breastfeeding. And so you can have increased hypermobility when you're already hypermobile. And so people will continue to experience back pain, pelvic pain, postpartum for longer periods of time. And then, you know, the fact that you've pushed a baby through your vagina disrupts your pelvic floor in general. But actually with the C-sections, we see a lot more dysfunction with that because you've cut the abdominal wall. So now you've created another injury and another disruption to that stability system. And so now you've taken away the core muscles that were creating pelvic stability. So you've got relaxin working against you. You've got your hypermobility working against you and you've got no abdominal muscles now. Plus you're exhausted because you've got an infant. There's kind of two ways that we could, we could take this and maybe both are important, which is one, like if you know you're hypermobile, what is it that you need to do in order to Mm -hmm. mitigate all of these issues. And then if you have those issues, what do you do? I typically tell people like nothing's off the table and, you know, lifting weights is great. Lifting heavy weights is fine. Okay. The problem that I end up seeing is that people will lift heavy weights and bodies are really smart. Bodies will recruit the muscle that's strong enough to do that most of the time. But then you're training the big muscles and not training those smaller muscles that need to be supporting those big muscles. And your body can do that for a little while, Mm -hmm. but then it starts getting tired of doing that. And then it starts having little tiny injuries that you maybe not aren't even aware of. And then it turns into a bigger injury. And you're like, I've been doing squats for two years. Why is this bothering me now? And it's because your pelvic floor literally can't take it anymore. So my advice would be you have to start smaller and train up to those higher levels if weightlifting is something that you want to do. But the successful way to mitigate some of the hypermobility issues is to really focus on those smaller stability muscles specifically. Um, you know, I don't want to get too nitpicky here with specifics, but, um, glutes super important. So glute max and glute med. A lot of times we forget about gluteus medius, which is the little guy on the side. And that, that also strengthens your pelvic floor. And then your deeper core. So it's not doing crunches. It's not doing, it's not using that big six pack muscle on top. It's using that deeper core muscle, your transverse abdominis that runs sideways and connects to your low back and creates that stability and that intra abdominal pressure. So exercises that are really successful for helping with the hypermobility component that I use a lot in clinic and recommend to people are things that require some static stability and then progressing into like a mobile stability. So Pilates is a great thing to do. 
um, whether it's mat, reformer, standing, those bar classes, that's why they probably why you feel like they helped you so much more is because they do, they focus on those tiny little stability muscles. It's all about having a stable central core and then doing other things that make you use your, your internal stability. Right. Versus being able to like use the big muscle to do the thing. Right. So a a question there, like to me, it's all in the nuance. So someone could go to these classes and still have issues. Like, for example, I know that when I was doing too much of the bar classes, my hips were bothering me. And I know that with Pilates, I had a friend who's taking, uh, who's training to be an instructor and I've done the reformer classes. And I will tell you when I did the private with her barely moving my legs, I, it was way, way harder than going to the reformer and trying to be all hypermobile with how far my legs would go, this, that, and the other, um, thinking that I'm building the core, but in fact, not as much as when I was barely doing anything and doing proper form. Yes. And so, yes. you know, I want to make sure that people understand that form is so, so important. So what are some of the mistakes that you're seeing people make? I mean, at a high level, I would say just assuming going to these classes is enough because it's doing the exercises right, even within them, right? Right. It's about doing them correctly within them. Um, And that's the really hard part because there's, you know, not all classes are created equal. You know, I was a big yogi too for a while because when you're flexible and you can hit all of those end range poses, it's super fun, right? right. Um, (laughs) But I've I've modified my practice to focus more on the stability part. I don't do the back bends anymore. I don't need to. My back's flexible enough. So I'll hold a plank instead. I don't hang out in those like bottom end range motions anymore. I maybe come out of it a little bit and then force my muscles to hold me for a little while. So there's little modifications that people can do, but you have to kind of have the knowledge in order to do that, right? And not all instructors have won the education or the ability to be able to do those kinds of things. So it's hard in the classes sometimes to really find. But if you can get a class where, especially if it's a beginner class where somebody can like really sit there with you and focus on what the correct form is, that makes a big difference. Or finding an instructor that's um, cross-trained in a lot of things. Like there's actually a lot of PTs that teach bar and Pilates on the side all the time. And so that's another way to get in there because they've got a little bit extra knowledge in some of the things to do. And it's not like they just took a weekend course to learn the routine, you know? Right. No, that's true. And if someone can afford it, maybe take one private and just say, look, I have hypermobility. Right. What are the things? And just have it as a very specific, teach me how to do this correctly so that when I'm in the mm-hmm. class, I don't try to follow and overperform because I'm so cool and hypermobile. Cause it is exciting to be flexible. I mean, I it know is. I sometimes go a little too far and it's just like, I probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> It is. Yeah, it is. So you alluded before, and I don't want to uh, drop this for um, any of the endometriosis patients listening, but you kind of were nodding your head. So what do we need to talk about with endo, this hypermobility, pelvic pain dynamic? I wish I had more information on it. We see the overlap. I don't know why. We don't know why, because okay. endometriosis, you don't have to be hypermobile to have endometriosis. And there's lots of, you know, one in 10 women has endometriosis and endometriosis itself presents in so many different ways. You know, you can have somebody that's got a really severe case, but doesn't have a lot of pain. And then somebody who's got a mild case, but has a ton of pain. I mean, maybe a personal theory I have with it is maybe people who are hypermobile because they experience more pains um, and they go to the doctors more frequently. Maybe they're getting a, more of a diagnosis with it because they're investigating things. Maybe because they have other problems already, they are more sensitive to their endometrial symptoms. And so they're getting more of a diagnosis. It could be something as simple as that versus, you know, from a scientific perspective with it. Yep. So from a pain perspective, um, you know, I know there's different ways 
to manage pain. And I'm, I'm thinking about how you were saying the ability to, I can't think of the word at the moment, repeat the pain and show it in the doctor's office. And you can't always say today we must call my pain because I'm at the doctor's office. Like we don't always know right. what's causing it. Right. It. Bring it on. Mm -hmm. And I'd actually interviewed Melissa Farmer a couple of years ago. And she was, um, she's like one of five people in this entire country who is trained in all of these sub areas around pain. And it was really, really interesting to talk to her about um, the research, but maybe you can tell us about this, the pain association as well with um, hypermobility and what to do about it? <laughs> hypermobility and pain is, it's complicated because there's, there's several different kinds of pain, right? So people with hypermobility, one, they're more prone to injuries, if you will. They're usually more clumsy. That's the, you know, lay term that people will use. They run into things, they trip and fall down, things like that. And it has to do with being more flexible and your brain can't quite tell exactly where you are in space. And so you fall down more. So they'll get more acute injuries like that. They get more ankle sprains, they get more strains and sprains, things like that. So you can get pain from that. Some people suffer more from numbness and tingling in places that don't fit a neurological pattern. I see that happening less um, with the hypermobile people, but there is a little association with that. But from a chronic pain perspective, you've got it's and chronic pain in itself is super complicated, right? Like we could talk for days about that. So the short version with the hypermobility is your body is getting such different levels of feedback for what movements and input and places that your joints are and your tissues are and things like that. Like you're just getting so many signals that your system can become more sensitive to things. And so then your actual like little nerve receptors that detect pain get more sensitive. So they start sending signals sooner than maybe they necessarily need to. And your brain can kind of attune to those more than they need to as well. And just being, you know, uh, because hypermobility has so many comorbidities with it too. So depression and anxiety are associated with them too. And having those changes in your endorphins and neurotransmitters also kicks up your pain centers. And so you'll see more of an association of chronic pain with that as well. Okay. So if they had to put it in a nice little envelope of how hypermobile people could take care of themselves, it's addressing yourself from the mental health perspective, from an overall wellness perspective, you know, with hydration and that kind of thing. Regular exercise, and it doesn't have to be anything big and crazy. Exercise really makes a big difference for people, even if it's just taking a walk. Um, but those smaller stability exercises make a really big difference for long-term and staying active because as we stop being active, we get more deconditioned, we get even weaker, and then the it just cascades and usually ends up getting worse from a pain perspective. So it sounds like that foundation is important. The foundation's important and then keeping up with some kind of that foundation. And then there's so much research too that shows just regular activity, um, you know, even if it's a 30 minute walk a couple times a week that has enough impact from um, an endorphin standpoint and from a nervous system standpoint that it starts down regulating your nervous system from a pain perspective. And so it actually does reduce overall levels of chronic pain as well. Physical therapy is also a great place to go. If you need this, the jumping off point, if you need help figuring out why does this hurt, but this doesn't. Um, and especially from the pelvic pain perspective, because sometimes exercise makes pelvic pain worse. And so seeing a therapist who can diagnose, are you at a stage where you need to rest and we need to do some tissue recovery? Or are you at a point where we need to train at a really low level so that you can tolerate the bigger things and help guide that process makes a really big difference. So I guess if you were to, you know, advise someone 
And again, I know it's not a straight shot, like linear, do this, this, and this, and then this, but if you maybe could just, just given all the patients that you've seen, is there a theme of how someone should navigate the healthcare system as they work through um, this situation? That's it's going to vary state to state too. Okay. Because not all healthcare systems are created equal. So where I currently operate, we're a direct access state as physical therapists. So you don't need a referral to come see us. Okay. So you don't have to go to your primary care doctor. You don't have to go to an OB to come in and see a physical therapist or even a pelvic PT. I think a clearer way to try to navigate if you're experiencing chronic pelvic pain is you do want to rule out, is there something larger medically that needs to be addressed? Is there a fibroid? Is there a cyst? You know, um, rule out the big cancer, things like that. So Mm -hmm. probably starting with, if you have to start with your primary care, that's where you go. And then going into a, um, GYN, just to make sure that from an organ standpoint, everything's functioning for the most part. And anywhere along that line, either at the primary care office or at the GYN, you can request a referral to physical therapy. And they sh- and you should be able to be co-treated. So while you're doing your diagnostics for the GYN workup, you can go to physical therapy and get that process started as well. You can also go directly to a physical therapist. And if they're, you know, good at what they do and they're within a good system, they can send you where you need to go. I'd say navigating PT can be hard too sometimes because not all PT places are created equally. So I'm fortunate enough where I work, I'm in a hospital-based system, which means that I'm in a clinic where I'm one-on-one with my patients. I have an entire hour with them. I'm never double booked. So I really get that quality time because it's hospital-based is a buzzword, one-on-one patient care is a buzzword, and then a nonprofit as well. Okay. And so then looking at what your PT qualifications are, the PTs from a pelvic perspective, especially if you're a complicated case that you're going to want to look for, are somebody who's got maybe a credential of um, a PRPC, it's a pelvic rehab practitioner certification or um, a WCS, which is a women's certified specialist. They're trying to change that name because it's not just women that have pelvic floors. So they're trying to change that to just general pelvic floor. But so those are the two um, advanced training, like alphabet soups that you'll see after somebody's name that can indicate that, that they may be at a pretty good qualification to help guide you in the process on where they need to go. Okay. That makes sense. And you know, what I would almost add to this is where, however you enter into the healthcare system and as you go through it, tell all the clinicians you have hypermobility. And if you don't know if you have it, I'll put in the show notes, the, the thing that you can at least look at as like a baseline to just, then it could be a, I think I have hypermobility, let's talk. But then I would reinforce that even if there is a clinician who isn't trained in this and dismisses it, it's really important to know that it is something that's going to impact your health. And so, and this is where I start is like, how do you advocate? Because, you know, I, I talk, I hear so many patient stories. I hear them from clinicians who are working with women who are struggling to navigate the system. And it's kind of like this, doctors can't keep up with everything. Patients know their body, so they can hopefully research something very specific to hopefully like raise the alarm with the doctor who may or may not know it because they have too many things that they're trying to keep track of and guidelines and things like that are constantly changing. I think it's important for patients to say those kinds of things. And you, unfortunately, you do have to be your own biggest advocate. And the, I 
unfortunately, I think hypermobility gets kind of pushed to the side a lot of the time in medicine. And part of it's because everything is so complicated anyway. And a lot of people don't know what to do with the hypermobile patient. And they don't really understand how that impacts everything that they're working on either. Yep. So I think you have to say that. And if you have a physician then that's dismissive of it, I would say that's a red flag. Yeah. For because sure. Because any, any clinician that really cares, if you bring up something that they don't necessarily know about, they're going to say, oh, I'm going to take that into consideration, or I'm going to look into that a little bit more, or tell me what that means to you, at least to get the patient's perspective on how they feel like that impacts their recovery. Yep, absolutely. And then um, I guess going back to something like digestion, you know, we talked about Mm -hmm. the foundation of staying healthy if you're hypermobile. So let's say I'm doing that and still have digestive issues. Cause I guess I'm just thinking like, it must be so frustrating. Like I know with my son, four years of being in tears, navigating and pleading and begging with these doctors. And I work in the healthcare system and it was so frustrating. And by the way, my son has hypermobility. Let's, you know, (laughs) and so it's just like, yeah, I mean, any, is it just, these are hard and you just have to keep troubleshooting for whatever works for you. And hopefully something will be the magic that finally helps, but just know the hypermobility component, at least you can control the get stable part. And then hopefully the other thing is you just find the right clinician. I mean, is that kind of where we're at right now? Unfortunately, yes. Mm -hmm. And every single person is different. One of my besties is also, you know, and she's a PA too. So, you know, she's in the system. She knows more about a lot of things than, you know, the the average person does. Right. And she even has a really hard time navigating stuff. She's got um, way more digestive issues than I do, but I have other issues that are more than her, even though we're both about the same on the flexibility scale and things like that. So it's so different person to person and it manifests so different in every single person. Yeah. That, yeah, it is. It's about finding what works for you. She finds that she's really sensitive to um, fiber, but then that's one thing that really helps my digestive stuff is making sure I get enough of it. It's both fascinating, but hopefully these little pieces will help someone put the puzzle together for themselves so that they can advocate mm-hmm. and navigate. But I think we all agree it's just, it's not this perfect thing. It's very imperfect and individualized. So. Yes. And I think that's the point that I really want to drive home too, because you can, when you're in the thick of it, you can start to feel crazy. Yeah. You can start to feel like, am I just being too, am I really being too sensitive about this? Is there really anything wrong? They say there's nothing wrong with me. So I want to validate people out there that are struggling with this because it's, it's hard and it's complicated and you're not crazy. My, my hope for the future and where I hope we end up going is that we get a much better increased awareness of all of this and that the medical community in general gets a better idea about it. And so, because if we can start having some interventions with people when they're a little bit younger I think that would be great. So I wish when I was younger, knowing that it's really cool that I can do all of these contortionist things, is that going to be best for my longevity? Maybe not. So are there things that I should be doing to cross train to keep my body the healthiest, knowing that maybe I shouldn't be sitting in one position for four hours, like a little book goblin reading, and that I need to get up and take breaks. Knowing how and when to listen to your body, learning some of those things. I hope that we figure out some of the digestive issues, because I think that would improve people's quality of life significantly. I don't know what the answer is for it, but I hope we figure it out one day. Yeah. Like, I really appreciate that you're 
working so hard on this. And I'm glad that you wrote that article because that's how I found you. And, you know, you're clearly the right person to be sharing this information. Um, so how can people find you? Find somebody who can really spend the time as well as looking for a place that's one-on-one -on -one, hospital-based nonprofit. That's where you're going to have the more likely opportunity to get a clinician that can give you the dedicated time because it's really hard when you're in a typical PT private practice where you've got four patients at one time and you only get 15 minutes with each patient before you pass them off to somebody to do exercises with them. So finding that kind of a clinic, I think, makes a really big difference. And you can always call the clinic and ask, too. That's actually how a lot of people end up finding me, is they call the front desk okay. and they ask who's good with this particular thing. Um, Got it. Like, I'm one of the only clinicians in my uh, building that treats TMJ. So people call and ask who does this and it's only me. So okay. they automatically get sent with me. Got it. Um, my front desk knows that chronic pain is my deal. So if anybody calls and sounds even remotely complicated, they end up on my schedule. Okay. So. Got it. So it, that's interesting. I never thought like, cause I just always thought, Hey, you're referred to PT, just go to PT. When you have your prescription, I never thought to say, this is what I have, who would do this. So that's a really great, yep. a really, really great. When tip. you're scheduling ask. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely. ask. Cause there's, really helpful. and if you, even if you don't, and you end up with somebody, if, I think if they're a decent clinician, they will say, I am not the right match for you. Okay. Allison, thank you so much for making time for this. This was an absolutely fabulous discussion. Thank you so much for having me. And that wraps up another empowering session here at the FemPower Health Podcast. Now, before you dash off, I've got a quick, exciting invitation for you. Please join our vibrant community by subscribing to our weekly newsletter because it's really your frontline update on groundbreaking women's health research, the latest health enhancing products, fun quizzes to boost your health IQ, and unique discoveries that you won't want to miss. All of this delivered straight to your inbox, cutting through the noise of social media algorithms. Love today's insights? Show your support by rating and reviewing our podcast. Your feedback is more than just a pat on our backs here at FemPower Health. It lights the way for others seeking guidance and community in their health journey, amplifying the voices that need to be heard. And for a deeper dive into today's topics, check out the show notes and explore our website at fempower-health.com. Our site is a treasure trove of knowledge, neatly categorized by topics of interest and life stages, ensuring you find exactly what you need to empower your health journey. And your voice matters to us deeply. Whether you have a question, a story to share, or feedback on our episodes, reach out directly at info at fempower-health.com. Drop us a message on social media or hit reply on any newsletter. Your insights inspire our conversations. And a quick note, the knowledge we share is here to embolden you in discussions with your healthcare provider. It's not medical advice. Always consult with your doctor for health decisions. And remember, the diverse perspectives of our guests reflect their individual journeys, and it's not an endorsement by FemPower Health. Here's to empowering your health journey one episode at a time, and I'll see you on the next FemPower Health podcast episode.